Okay, just waiting for everyone to kind of filter in. Hope everyone's having a fantastic day. It's been really nice here in the valley with the cloud cover, although it's been a little bit humid, but not too bad and definitely needed the rain. All right. So. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Allison Lester, the Associate Director of Visitor and Member Engagement. I'm coming to you live from the Heard Museum. I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual art talk, Indigenous Painters Painting with Nanaba Shakan and Patrick Dean Hubble. I'm gonna go over a few brief housekeeping items. Today's event is a webinar, which means you will only see and hear from our panelists. Uh, the chat box is open. Just make sure you select everyone if you would like your comments to be seen by more than just me and the panelists. At the end of the discussion, I'll come back on to open the Q&A, but you're welcome to submit your questions at any time. You can either do so in the chat box or in the Q&A button down below. I will be monitoring both. If you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to call the membership helpline. I went ahead and listed that number as the first comment in the chat. We will also have a brief survey for you at the conclusion event. So we really appreciate your responses uh, to that. They definitely help these uh, webinars just become better and better. And we really value that feedback. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel, usually within the next few days, uh, no more than a week. You can check out all of our earlier virtual art talks there. I think we're up to like 23 or something like that. So a lot of great content to look back on. And uh, without further delay, um, I will turn this over to our moderator, fine arts curator, Aaron Joyce, who will introduce the rest of the panelists. And I'll see everyone again for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. I think you're in for a really uh, wonderful discussion and I'm personally very excited to hear both of our uh, guest artists speak about their work. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce both of them. Uh, Nanaba Chacon is a Dine, Navajo and Chicana artist. She is most recognized as a painter and muralist. Chacon was born in Gallup, New Mexico and grew up on both the Navajo reservation and in New Mexico. She is currently based in Albuquerque. Chacon's most notable works have been within the public arts sector in which she has a cumulative experience of over 20 years. Her experience or her practice includes other mediums and a developed aptitude in painting, installation, illustration, and design. In 2003, Chacon received her bachelor's in education from the University of New Mexico. She has seven years in teaching experience in the classroom and has also written curriculum for alternative educational programs. Chacon's work as an artist often includes community-based integration and social practice, working as key components within public work pieces, within the public work pieces she creates. Creating public works facilitates a social engagement process, making community a central part of her process, as well as elevates her personal philosophy that art should be accessible and a meaningful catalyst for social change. Her work has been recognized for its unique style and attention paid to site specificity and content, as well as the integration of socio-political issues affecting women and indigenous peoples. As a painter, Chacon is a figurative based artist. While subject matter explores ideas of indigenous culture, bringing the complexity of indigenous peoples to the forefront. The content of her work is used to incite dialogue through philosophical personification and symbolism. Chacon currently exhibits across the United States and abroad. She has maintained a career as a painter, muralist, and educator, as well as activist, creating works both nationally and internationally, while working with multiple organizations and institutions, receiving commissions and collaboration opportunities worldwide. The most notable being the National Endowment for the Arts, California Endowment for the Arts, US Consulate and Embassy in Russia, the Obama Foundation, New Mexico Public Arts Foundation, National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, Navajo Nation Museum, National Hispanic Cultural Center, and the Museum of Native Contemporary Art. Her clients have included Facebook, GoPro, NBC Universal, NPR, Comedy Central, Honor the Years, and Sons and Brothers. Patrick Dean Hubble is a multidisciplinary artist whose work is an exploration of his Diné indigenous identity within the contemporary moment. The foundation of his practice uses the inspiration of indigenous cultural methodologies, references traditional indigenous art and philosophy, and the abstract representations of language, nature, time, and place. 
Using a variety of mediums, including natural earth pigment collected from his Diné homelands, traditional two-dimensional painting and drawings, as well as installation, his work aims to challenge impositions of categorization and perpetuate aspects of indigenous identity within the Western ideological ideologies of contemporary art. Philosophical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of life are translated through the combination of intuitive gestural mark making, automatic drawing, and elements of design and symbology. By expanding the principles and aesthetics of, West, of the Western canon, recontextualizing traditional two-dimensional medium, two mediums and painting formats in correlations to indigenous art, his work seeks to include visibility of the indigenous experience. Hubble is originally from the Navajo Nation, located in the southwestern region of the United States. Hubble's work has been exhibited in galleries, museums, and institutions nationally and internationally, and can be found in numerous public and private collections. In 2017, Hubble was awarded the Pollock Krasner Grant. He is the recipient of the New Art Society Award in 2019 and holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He currently lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. So without further ado, I hope you join us in welcoming our guests and please um, sit back and enjoy listening to Patrick share about his work. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it um, for the um, introduction. Uh, I just want to uh, introduce myself. Shea uh, Patrick Dean Hubble in Shea Tohanan Nishle. The best is in a bushes chain. Kiani does a chay, do hon ochni e does another. Awkward ego e dene nishle. That's how I identify myself as dene. Those are my clans uh, within our family, extended family, uh, community clan system that we have within our people. And I uh, just want to say thank you um, for this opportunity to speak about my practice and um, some of the intention behind my work and um, to be in conversation with uh, you, Aaron, Nani, and thank you for that. So you can go to the next slide, please. So I'll go ahead and um, get started with um, this piece here, her soothing touch surrounds me. And um, this piece is from 2016. Um, and this body of work was um, titled Earth Untitled. And um, within the use of uh, Diné cultural methodologies as inspiration of um, correlating Navajo traditional sand painting to um, my background in uh, the Western art of of uh, being trained at uh, within an art institution, art school, uh, began to draw connection from uh, the way our people um, gather pigment, collect pigment, and then they use it within a, a healing ceremony and within our people's um, teachings, their songs, their stories, and their uh, life ways. I, um, began to uh, investigate some of these uh, teachings behind that. And then also um, wanting to um, honor the earth through using this um, earth pigment. I began to uh, go out and seek uh, different colors of pigments throughout the Navajo Nation and uh, was um, processing the pigment myself. And then also um, creating that connection to uh, paint processing, paint making within the traditional, uh, the European way of uh, making uh, paint. And um, so a lot of these works from 2016 um, combine a lot of the gestural mark making with uh, design elements over uh, overlaying the top of these uh, surfaces and um, a lot of the thought process behind these is uh, using a lot of the nature and uh, the stories and the songs that I was fortunate enough to be able to be raised around by uh, uh, traditional Dene elders, uh, my grandparents, and a lot of uh, the 
medicine people that um, I was able to um, experience and witness some of these things and I began to um, create work that was a personal reflection of how um, these uh, this cultural knowledge could uh, become a catalyst for creative self-expression and some of these things that are of personal interest to me um, wanting to obtain more uh, information about these teachings um, trying to learn our cultural ways and our um, some of these teachings that are uh, rooted in Diné philosophy cultural knowledge and um, so that's been a lot of um, a way that has motivated me to continue my art practice and then also um, from the personal experience of um, memory, time, nature, um, time and place, um, I was able to um, start to investigate some of these uh, teachings around um, the significance of the earth and how um, the titling you you'll see her soothing touch surrounds me and creating that um, personification of our mother earth or nasan shema is how um, we um, identify and um, speak with our mother earth and um, so i was really interested in that relationship between uh my human experience my personal experience and then my relationship to the natural environment and um so you can go to the next slide so jumping forward um to 2021 um still incorporating a lot of uh the same um process of um design elements, geometric abstract design forms on top of uh, the history of mark making on the canvas underneath. And um, this is a recent work that was a personal reflection of um, my time um, in, um, in Chicago. I uh, was uh, really reflecting on a lot of the, um, my, my experience there within um, at the School of the Inst Art Institute of Chicago. And um, I began to um, receiving this Western education um, there at this institution, prestigious institution, and uh, um, began to think about the homelands, the traditional homelands of uh, the indigenous nations there, uh, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Odawa, Sac and Fox, Illinois, Kickapoo, uh, Miami, Muscatlin, Weya, Delaware, Winnebago, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and the uh, Meskwaki people. And um, I began to think about their language, their stories, their songs, um, the cultural knowledge, and the um, some of the way that their their people have, have come to survive you know, within that um, region of the Midwest. And um, I began to think about my um, place within that landscape and I was I was really grateful to experience that um, and also to um, just really be able to be present within that landscape the the vegetation the, the water there at uh, Lake Michigan was really a powerful experience for me to experience um, to have that and then um, so at this point in time um, I was um, I began to use this zigzag or chevron pattern um, pretty um, prominently within my work. And that um, is also um, correlated to some of my earlier work, uh, referencing the geometric design of textiles and um, weavings and um, beadwork, basketry. So pulling these different elements of uh, indigenous art, uh, art forms, um, pulling them into my experience with within um, that landscape. So you can uh, go ahead and continue on. Next slide, please.
And then in two, going back to 2020, um, honoring our foremothers um, was a um, pivotal point in my studio art practice, uh, becoming more multidisciplinary and uh, really thinking about um, the, the personification of uh, our teachings, our stories, our songs, our, the language of our uh, um, deities, the, the language of how we address certain elements within the natural environment. And um, when, when, you, when you hear our language, when you learn about our language, um, their, their actual um, personifications as if you're speaking and describing about um, uh, an entity or uh, a person, if you, if you will. So I began to really think about that connection um, between what my paintings were. When I, when I first started painting, uh, I was trying to explore these different, um, different teachings and different uh, values and, and how it was a, um, my personal experience of, of um, um, incorporating them into my work and also internalizing them as as myself, as an individual. And um, so this, this work, uh, I began to think about uh, the materiality of canvas as um, relating to a blanket or a textile, and then also uh, the materiality of uh, what I was using, the natural earth pigment, and then also experimenting more with different um, um, representations of display of the traditional Western art uh, substrate of a painting, a uh, stretched canvas around a stretcher bar frame, and um, been, was investigating, deconstructing that kind of a thought process to be more organic and to be more uh, um, significant of how I was told about different elements of our, our uh, blankets and then how I, um, think about that as far as a, a spiritual identity of um, these different elements uh, wrapped in blankets or a spiritual identity of for protection of within these blankets and then in in relation to painting so you'll see the stretcher bar up top with the canvas draping from it um, still in the conversation of uh, painting and um, but also the embodiment of uh, these uh, spiritual um, figures, their presence the, within our stories, our songs, our teachings. And um, so they, they started as these uh, abstract representations of um, personally reflecting um, my, my thought process and within my art practice. And then they also um, have a connotation to uh, how the presentation of, of blankets or, or, um, would be, I guess, within um, the, the, the spiritual identity of uh, figures. You can go to the next slide, please. And then um, a portrait of your spiritual movement. Uh, so continuing on with uh, further exploration of uh, expanding the idea of substrate and the display within Western art, um, Western contemporary art, uh, thinking about Native American portraiture and Native American figurative art within Western painting um, and um, the correlation that the uh, gold frame has within a lot of the museum institutions, within a lot of uh, collections uh, throughout the United States and abroad um, about Native American peoples. And um, I began to start to want to deconstruct that, um, that um, imposition of categorization within, um, upon, uh, that was set upon indigenous people and then still uh, reflecting about the spiritual presence of uh, stories, songs, uh, uh, ceremony 
and um, how those are a reflection of uh, us as indigenous people and how these um, um, creating a portrait of, of that using this blanket and um, also with unknown um, figure within the gold frame as the, the portrait and um, really con making connection to the surface of the canvas, uh, holding uh, gestural mark making and holding um, uh, my personal intuitive thought process, creative process and really um, building a surface history and then um, making that co connection to portraiture. And um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And uh, this image is uh, from 2016, um, making a jump back to the first piece. Uh, you'll see it on the right-hand side um, with the Earth Untitled uh, solo exhibition in, in Santa Fe. Um, so this, um, I began to uh, explore installation with uh, making that connection again to uh, sand painting of um, within a contemporary connection to contemporary painting. Um, so you'll see the pieces um, on adjacent walls all throughout the exhibition space. So this this entire exhibition installation um, starts at that center point within the uh, sand painting at the bottom, and you'll see each color um, is connected to the four sacred directions and uh, branches out from that center point, connecting to the paintings of uh, uh, with within the wall space. And um, I, I really was really interested in um, exploring and activating the entire space of. Uh, an exhibition space, but also um, allowing the viewer to make that connection from that one starting point and branching out, and then and also uh, in a clockwise direction. Of, uh, so, so some of these uh, teachings and um, Diné philosophy, Diné cultural knowledge uh, that I was able to um, internalize throughout my time growing up. Um, it began to make its presence known through my creative um, thought process and then it started branching out from there through um, traditional um, substrate of stretch canvas um, and then now starting to become more dis multidisciplinary of uh, in investigating sculptural sculptural forms and then also really exploring uh, different mediums and then incorporating that into a combination of um, how um, uh, my place within the contemporary moment, what it means to be uh, indigenous um, for myself, um, trying um, to be um, in, um, trying to be involved in community, uh, family, um, trying to um, continue on these life ways of our people, and then also for myself and my children. And then how does that um, uh, connect to art making studio practice? And then how does that connect to, um, in, a, in a broader broader sense of the contemporary art uh, world or the art field. Um, so that's a lot of what I'm investigating right now. And um, that's about it. Just want to say thank you. And I'll go ahead and that'd be my time. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, that was super interesting. I, I really love the portrait piece. Um, for a moment there, I thought you were gonna say, um, I wanted to destroy the, the Native American portrait, but you used the word deconstruct, which was very tactful. 
<laughs> but I, want, I was in my mind hearing the word destroy, which is which is great. Um, okay. Anyway, hi everyone. My name is Nanaba Chakon. Um, I'm Dine, and happy to Dine and Chicana. Um, I'm happy to be here with all of you guys and share my work. I'm currently right now in, in Albuquerque in my home and uh, happy that you guys are all here joining me likewise. And uh, thank, thank you for sharing your work, Patrick. It's very inspiring. Um, you could go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, so this collection of work that I have, um, I really just wanted to take an opportunity to kind of show some of my paintings, which I, I don't show too much of. Um, I actually have, haven't been doing a great deal of studio painting um, in the past couple of years. The majority of my work has been public work pieces um, by the way of murals uh, and public other public work kind of installations. Um, so those are always on site and I haven't I haven't done too much um, studio practice paintings, but I have I have begun in the past um, about five years or so returning back to doing a studio practice and and painting and the paintings that I've created in that time have been very, very large scale works. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on kind of how I began as a painter. And just for anyone who is tuning in who doesn't, who, who might not be familiar with that. But um, when I began painting, I, I started off doing graffiti and I started off making work um, that was large in scale. Um, I didn't really have a, an artistic practice before then. I didn't really even draw before then. Everything that I learned as far as scale, color, um, the way to lay out things, the way to think and conceptualize space really came um, early on. I started when I was about 15 and con did graffiti until I was about 25. So for a good 10 years, um, that was the main, the main work that I made and it was always, you know, outdoors. I got to the point where I rarely even drew um, in sketchbooks anymore. It was pretty much all improvisation. Uh, it was very much letter based, although I did um, eventually learn how to draw shapes and forms and um, characters and cartoonish kind of things and then kind of move into a more um, refined, studied um, figurative forms. And so I feel like my, my strength and the place that I'm most comfortable at as a painter has and continues to be in a large scale format. And it, it took me a little bit to, um, you know, kind of go back into that process. And it's been interesting right now in my life to, to have these reflections on this moment because um, I didn't, study study art at college I, I studied being a teacher and um and so to have this you know these revelations about like how I make work my intentions behind making work and where I started and where I'm at now is kind of interesting um coming into it like 20 20 25 years later um but yeah I I feel the most I feel I feel the best when I'm working on a large scale and so for the past five years, I've been making about one large scale painting as part of a studio process. And um, I don't show those too much as a collection. So I'm happy to share that with you guys today. Um, this painting I started, this is kind of one of the first pieces that I began um, about five years ago in 2017. And I did this up in Canada. And it was a little bit of an, an experiment. Um, I was up there on a in a residency at the Banff Center, and as a muralist, they they um, invited me as a muralist, but were like, "If you paint the walls, you gotta like return it back to normal <laughs> in your studio." So for me, it didn't really seem like something I wanted to do is just to like paint an ephemeral mural that only I would see and then like paint over it. So I had started using this material called Polytab 
it's a material that uh, mirrorless use a lot to create these these installation pieces um, you can adhere it to a wall and and it and you can also paint it in studio i have used it a few times on murals but i i prefer to just like go directly on the wall um, but for me it it uh it was easy to transport it's pretty light um, it gives a really kind of nice surface and there's something about it in itself that I enjoy because it's kind of the, the mixture between paper and canvas and it has a very, very light format and a light texture. And that's one of the things that I really do love about creating murals is I think they're such monumental works that are essentially ephemeral. And I like the ephemeral quality. I like I like the timestamp on it. I like the aging of it, and I like that um, that you have to experience it. That there's no way you could ever experience the totality of the piece instead of standing it um, by by standing in. You can't experience it any other way than standing in front of it in the moment that you're standing in front of it. And I think that that's very important to the work itself. So this material in a, in a weird way actually makes me feel, have kind of the same feelings about a wall. Um, in this time, I chose to use this residency to, to dive into our Diné uh, creation stories. And uh, since it was uh, winter time to really, to really read them and to really study them and and uh, wasn't sure if I would illustrate them or kind of draw content for them, but really just wanted to, to take the time to, to give myself that, to, to immerse myself in, in, uh, in, in that, the, those stories. And um, so this piece is uh, of our, it, it references our, our creation stories. It's the, the Nudle and um, it's the third gender. So the, the gender that that re, that rests between man and woman, and the the imagery and the creation around around that piece was was really beautiful to me. Um, I more and more that I learn, um, I didn't grow up completely traditional, and I didn't grow up learning uh, Navajo. I didn't. I don't speak Navajo fluently. And so for me, um, the more and more that I'm able to learn in time and especially as a woman and, and taking on that responsibility um, going into the future, it's, I really see how um, sophisticated, how intellectual, how, how, much of guide, how much guides our stories are um, into the future. And I, I'm always astonished when I read them. Um, so I began, I began this work. This is a very large painting. Um, it's about 10 feet high, um, and about maybe about 13 feet long. And, uh, this was, this was one of the first very, very large scale works that I did. You can go ahead and, um, move to the next one. Um, this is a more recent work and I did this piece um, recently as a commission uh, for the Harwood Museum in Taos, and it was a commission for an exhibition of a show. Um, and the show uh, is about, it's currently up right now for the next six months, um, if any of you guys wanna see it or in the area. Um, but it was about uh, low rider culture and uh, santero making. And I thought that that was just such an interesting preface for a show um, because in some ways they seem to derive from two very different worlds, but yet uh, growing up in New Mexico, growing up Chicana, growing up in the Southwest, I can definitely see the correlations. And I'm always interested in the layers of work, the layers of ideas and those intersections um, between culture, between time, history, uh, beliefs, philosophies. I think that that's that that in that like in between. That's where the interesting conversations arise, and that's where like new ideas begin. And so, in thinking of that concept, um, I really began to think about the duality that exists within religion, 
and that also uh, exists within this within lowrider culture. I mean, on one end, it's like kind of almost like heavily misogynistic, and it's very male based, and you you have this long tradition of men who who create these cars. Although there are women also who also build cars and have have a place for that, but the more celebrated side of women in that role is um, is modeling. And, and every time you see a photograph taken, and even when you go to car shows, you see women modeling with cars. And I really wanted to elevate that position and give agency to the women who are choosing to do this. And um, really, understand that that is 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 a sacred position and a, and a unity um as much as we want to maybe take those uh divine uh relationships between mary magdalene and jesus um the virgin mary and god and kind of kind of unite those but also to elevate this woman almost to a, to a goddess standard and um so i i put her in in this position um, modeling with a car, but I, I took out the car. Um, I didn't, it's, it was taken directly from a, a model reference, but I just erased the car out of the picture and really wanted to elevate, um, elevate her. But also I think that there's just something so interesting and um, awkward, but elegant and strong about her positioning. And um, I was completely fascinated when I started doing that um, because I think that that's something that also takes a tremendous amount of skill. So this painting um, is 15 feet high, like I said before. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of kind of is this illustrative style that I um, haven't done in a really, really long time, but I have to tell you guys I had a lot of fun painting this painting. Um, I I like I put the the religious tattoos all over her body. Um, I think that for me that's kind of reaffirming the idea of um, you know the body is a the body is a temple and the body is sacred and really just adorning this woman and and kind of bringing her to this this heightened stature um, of a woman. And so, yeah, go, you can go ahead and advance to the next one if you like. This is another large scale work. Um, let me just move my thing over real quick. Um, what dreams are made of. And early on in, and you may have noticed this in the last two paintings, um, I, at some point in mural making and my artistic practice, I started kind of doing this thing with my work where I wanted to diminish a foreground and a background. I think working in a figurative mode, um, you kind of learn these tropes at some time that like, you know, the portrait when you're creating or assembling a portrait that there's a foreground, middle ground and a background. and I don't necessarily think about any of these as being portraits, but I do think of them as being an idea. And when we think about ideas, um, there's more of a, a fluidity and there's more of a, um, a congregation of maybe many things coming together. And so I, I wanted in some way to, to mimic that in my work and, and diminish any idea of a foreground, middle ground, and a background, and put those kind of all on the same plane. And a lot of that was, um, when I refer to these works, sometimes I think of them as conceptual weavings. And really it's the weaving together of different objects, different ideas, or kind of this placement of bringing two things together on the same plane. And then kind of releasing that. Um, of course, every artist has their connotations. They have their intentions of work um, and why they make them. But also, I think that part of it is just leaving that to the viewer to to have their own attachments, to have their own and their own connotations, their own feelings, expressions. Um, anytime somebody can be in front of your work and, and um, 
look at that, they're always going to bring their own set of emotions, whether from that day, from their life, from their own traumas. Um, this piece was really about um, creating something that existed in two different worlds and two different notions of beauty. Um, this very classical form of beauty and, of course, a very cultural form of beauty. And I, I've always grown up, this is, this is like my dream car. This is a car I really wish one day I will own and I will drive it down the streets of Central, <laughs> um, out on the res too. <laughs> I, will be, I will be in this car at some point, but um, really what, what those notions of beauty are and how, how we obtain them. And the classical form, of course, of all paintings throughout time is the roses, flowers. Um, it's to the point of such unexplainable beauty. It's almost cliche, um, but yet, yet we can't deny that 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 is that is the the universal symbol of of uh, of beauty in paintings and art and delicacy and everything. Um, and so I really wanted to join these two things together and uh, create a composition of it. And really just to create a composition that, that kind of teetered, teetered with these two ideas. And I like the idea um, always of combining uh, ideas of modernity and classicalism, um, you know, the automotive against something very natural and the very hard against something that's very soft. So I always think that there's that there's interesting layers that occur naturally there. Um, for me, also in process and creating this work, um, this is just like a side tangent into into my mind and process and in the studio. Is um, I don't use any Photoshop or anything like that. Um, it it kind of I I do it all as it happens. So. Um, I, I draw this, but don't actually know how things will kind of start to fall together until it becomes an actual thing. Um, and until, so it, it, it's almost like a composition um, as it's developing. And for me, that's always exciting to kind of play, play with the placement of things and to see this like, um, like this, I don't know, luck of overlapping and composition that happens just by things kind of maybe in their own aesthetics or, or uh, mathematical aesthetics line up and kind of be really interesting and beautiful. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that part of process and I'm always, I'm always happy when that happens. Okay, you can move to the next one. Um, these next couple of slides are some recent uh, mural projects that I do. Um, right now, I, I would still say the majority of my work, about 80% of my work is uh, public work pieces, murals. Um, during the pandemic, it was uh, a little bit, a little bit, you know, less. I did a little bit less, of course, because everyone was doing a little bit less. Um, but these are these are some of the more recent projects that I worked on. These are all community engaged projects. I decided to to include that that side of the practice, although sometimes I do do work that is just commissions. I did one in Albuquerque recently. That's a fairly large piece at a community center, but I didn't include it in here. Um, this piece was really interesting, and I think uh, an interesting segue into painting into murals because this painting actually felt this mural actually felt like a painting to me. Um, and a lot of the times in my community engaged process, the idea behind that is one that the work is focused on a specific site and that the I'm really interested in that the work acts as a conversation um, that it garners um, it garners conversation from from what it is from the community members that are involved and also from the landscape that it resides in so those three components are always most always um 
working in in the pieces that I create. So this piece was created at Valle de Oro, which is an urban um, wildlife refuge. It's on the far, 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 far south side of Albuquerque, almost toward Isleta Pueblo. Um, and what it was, was it was at one point this gathering place for all of these birds that would migrate. And at some point, somebody bought this gigantic stretch of land and used it for cattle grazing. So it got leveled, alfalfa got put in there, but the birds, which is very, very incredible, um, continue to, to come here. And it's very, very beautiful. So this, this um, piece is out in a field, huge, huge field. And what the conservancy, the, the refuge decided to do is in the moments right now, while it is in re rehabilitation, um, instead of making little signs and little plaques of, you know, like this will be potential wetlands at some point and be restored to wetlands, or this will be, um, you know, uh, the watershed, or this will be, you know, the Bosque region. Um, they had artists, which were five art artists, all women, uh, to paint these these conceptual signages. And so I worked with conservators. Um, I worked with the staff at the refuge and we really came up with the, the concept for this piece. This one is um, kind of gonna sit a little bit more towards the entrance. So it was kind of an overarching idea of, of the idea of conservancy. And one of the things that um, through our conversation, so all of these are of course, um, plants and species that, that are native to the region, that are indigenous plants to the region. And um, one of the things that one of the conservators said that really stuck out to me was um, that we are not the conservators. Uh, we don't wanna be the conservators. We want, we want everyone to be the conservators. We want it, we, we need the, we need, a, we need it to tip where, where the people feel like they, they are the conservators of the land. Um, not scientists, not anything like that, but, but the children and their parents, they're really the stewards and they're the ones that are gonna conserve these spaces. So um, this piece is titled Constellations and it's really about um, the symbiotic relationships we have within nature and are with each other and how there is an interconnected relationship between all of those and how we have to recognize our place within all of those and see that we contribute to that as much as everything else does. Um, yeah, so that piece was very, very nice. I took a long, long time painting this because I loved being painting this huge billboard out in the middle of a field surrounded by wild birds. So I, I think I took about like, I don't know, five months or something, which is a long time for me. But um, it was really beautiful and, and definitely had a lot of experimentations as far as painting, which sometimes I don't always get to do in a mural. Uh, so you can go on to the next one. This piece I created last month. Um, this was at in Idlewild. Uh, California at Idlewild Arts. Um, it was a very, very long process. I collaborated with a really accomplished uh, Cohia basket maker, Roseanne Hamilton, and really wanted to create a piece that acknowledged um, that where this piece resides and where the school resides um, is essential and has always been essential and remains to be essential to Quahia people. Um, this is the, the landscape where a lot of the materials for their traditional basket making are, are collected. And the, the thing that's important to understand um, and that I, I, I learned about, about Quahia is that, um, and it's very, of course, very similar with Diné is that our, our traditional um, arts are not just like merely aesthetic, it's connected to everything. It's connected to our being, who we are, um, 
and there's a reason and a placement out of all of that. So to take away one is really diminishing part of another and diminishing part of the people. And so we really wanted to, to make a piece that honored all of that and spoke about these connections. And we also taught a class together. We taught a class to six young women and uh, which was on botanical illustration. So they learned to identify, but also learn the, the uh, properties and the uses of these plants in relationship to Quijia basket making. And um, this, this piece was really, really, really beautiful to work on. And uh, I always uh, love the opportunities. Whenever I work in other places, um, it's always such, such an incredible learning experience. And it's one of the main reasons I, I really love the process of creating work in this way. For me, the process of, um, you know, the relationships and, and working with different people and um, especially different indigenous uh, nations is always the most gratifying part. And to me, like the art side of it, that's the fulfilling side of it. And then this is the product that comes after. So, and then you could show the next one. And this was a piece, a very, very large piece um, that I did last year. Uh, it was the only uh, really new commission that I took on during the pandemic. Um, but a very, very special piece. And I was happy, happy that um, all of kind of my energy got got to be utilized in this way and got to be used for this work. Um, this piece was supported by the Tulsa Art Fellowship and also by the Native Arts and Culture Foundation Mentor Fellowship. I had an apprentice at the time of creating this work, Lynette Jesus, um, who assisted me on this project. Um, this project was put together by another painter, great painter, um, and muralist, Yataka Starfields. And he he was interested, he is from, from Oklahoma, and he was very much interested and concerned that for the, the large popula populations of Native nations that are in and around Tulsa, um, that there are actually, as of now, including this work, only two public art pieces that exists by indigenous artists. And so he created an, an initiative to have more um, work be created. And this work, it, it, uh, it was kind of a journey in a way. Um, it started out, of course, with the intention of being a community engaged work and then the pandemic hit and it couldn't be a, a community engaged work. And, um, you know, Yataka said, why don't you just design something, you know, whatever you're feeling and let's still make it happen because I'm afraid if we let this move on too far, it's not ever gonna happen. And uh, so I, I just kind of, you know, did painted in this, with this work, what I wanted and, and what I was missing and, and what I felt like I wanted to see. And a lot of times that's the impetus of a lot of my work is just, creating the thing in the world that I haven't seen that I want to see. And uh, at this time and moment, I was really missing gathering. I was really missing coming together. I was missing ceremonies. I was missing, you know, hearing, uh, you know, being able to go to people's canadas and feast days and, you know, even our powwows, all of it. I was just really, really missing those gathering moments and the dancing and the drumming and, um, you know, for us, it's, it's really about connecting. We connect with one another in that way. I think for indigenous peoples, connecting with our community is so, so, so important. It's part of, part of who we are, but it's also how we connect in prayer and how we connect to the earth. And, um, you know, when we're in isolation or lockdown, uh, those, those were very hard things to cope with. So I, I really wanted to remember that. And so I, I designed this piece of these dancing feet. And, um, but then when I started to, you know, render the designs on the moccasins and the leggings, um, I realized I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge about 
um, the regalia from these these places. So I asked Yataka if he could connect me with local people, so that way um, I could be able to reference uh, reference local people who are there um, for for their their moccasins and their 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 designs on their on their regalia that they have. And um, it was really, really cool. We got tons and tons of photos. Um, I wish I could have painted them all. <laughs> um, it was really, really such a neat process and just really beautiful, really beautiful to see that. And so I was able to incorporate and, and work with, um, I worked with a, a group that his mom actually uh, works with called um, Post-Traditional collective and they they do a number of things in organization in the arts and in Tulsa and so I was really really happy um, to work with Anita and she's really the one to help help get the word out about about um, getting some some proper reference for this work but it was really really special this piece um, it's about 16 feet high and 111 feet long and we painted it um, in about 10 days, maybe maybe 11. <laughs> um, but that's about it. I think that's all my slides, but thank you everyone. And I look forward to hearing your questions if you have any. And thank you for, for giving me your ears and your time. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to hear a little bit more about your practice and and what goes into not only when you create the work, but just the concepts and the, the ideas that you're both uh, playing with. Um, and one thing that kept coming up for me was this idea of, of landscape. Um, I think for, for both of you, you know, looking at your work, it's not what maybe, you know, sort of the Western art canon would necessarily call a landscape. Um, but like for your work, Patrick, it's, I mean, it's often made out of specific pigments from your homelands. Um, it's, it's made from the land and you know, your work, Nani, your, your murals are, are part of a landscape. And there, there's this reference to the site, um, both in, in scale or in material um, that I think is is really interesting and really beautiful um, and creates a connection to the land and to the people from those lands. Um, one question I have for you, Nani, to start off is you, you mentioned um, with the, the constellations piece that when you were painting, it felt like a painting. And I, it made me wonder when you're working on a mural versus in your studio, um, how does that feel different or how does that feel similar? Yeah, um, I mean, it's all painting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, it is it is very different. Process is very, very different. I think in my studio, um, I, I have the room, I have the the candidness, you know, to to experiment a little more to try different things. And to me, that feels like what painting is painting always mm -hmm. feels experimentation. It feels like mark making. It feels like um, moving color in different ways. Um, those are the things that are exciting to me um, mm -hmm. as a painter. And so to me in the studio, when I when I work like that, to me, I, that's what I that's when I feel like a painter, you know, that's, that's what it feels feels interesting and exciting to me on a mural. Um, you're working against many, many different elements and time. So, you know, a lot of the times, especially if I travel, I'm there for like three weeks, two weeks, one week, you know, whatever that time allotment is, mm -hmm. it's very long days. Um, the bigger a mural gets, uh, the more kind of methodical you have to be in your process to be able to approach something that size. Um, so I think that while experimenting, I, I always do try, to keep experimentations because for me that keeps me interested in the work and I think it's just essential. I mean, I change things, I redraw things. Um, you know, sometimes I, I make color adjustments, those kind of things, but it, it it's a little less freer. Um, on the place, on the piece at Valle de Oro, 
because I had a lot of time to just kind of be out there alone, nobody was going to bother me. Um, I, I could kind of, you know, play basically and, and uh, experiment and move things around. And there's places on there. I left it, you know, I left, if you were up close to it, um, you know, you would see like pencil markings and layers of paint. And I completely darkened the entire background to this like deep, deep, deep blue. And I just kept getting deeper and deeper and pink <laughs> over. And, you know, those are things that I think if I was on a mural at some point, I'd just be like, it's got, it's going to stay, you know, it's yeah. got to stay and that's it. We're living with it. But, um, you know, being able to do that and be out there and really, really be out there so much too, that the piece gets got to adjust um, in different um, light, you know, it, like I was out there at sunrise and I was out there at sunset and I don't, you know, it was just such a unique experience to be able to paint out there um, in so many different um, shifts of light. Light is also like such an important thing to painting. So Definitely. yeah, it, it really did feel, feel like kind of the in-between of both of mm -hmm. those. Definitely. And, and Patrick, one thing that I think, at least for me, um, I don't know um, everyone else, but, you know, looking at sort of this evolution of your work um, in the slides that you shared with us today and, um, you know, sort of at first, you, you know, the sort of quote unquote more traditional, you know, stretched canvas, um, you know, with a variety of different mediums that you're applying to the canvas and then seeing, as you said, sort of interrogating um, the sort of armature or the substrate of, of, you know, what's known as Western painting and, and, you know, breaking it apart it, or as Nani said, destroy it. <laughs> um, uh, what was that process like for you when you first decided to start experimenting and, and deconstructing it? Um, yeah, the start of the process for me, um, you know, some of the larger scale canvas works that I create um, are created unstretched. Um, so within my studio uh, practice, um, I'll have uh, canvas uh, prepped and stapled to the wall. And that's how I'll kind of uh, generate a piece from the beginning. And, um, you know, I was just, um, I had a studio there um, that, through the school and, um, in downtown Chicago and um, space was limited um, and I was doing a lot of experimentation and um, I just started accumulating all a lot of this uh, canvas and started to pile up and kind of um, get it in my studio space in a really um, I guess hands-on type of uh, presence that I was able to see the material and feel the, the history of the mark making and then also with the automatic drawing and um, starting, starting to uh, create that process of everything just being involved. And um, so I, I was also um, starting to experiment with uh, draping the pieces, draping the canvas and making that connection to uh, uh, incorporate canvas as materiality as well. Um, Holding, holding history, um, the actual function of fiber, and then also um, how it connects to uh, the relation to textile or bl blanket work. And um, so those are things I was really investigating. Well, I think that it's, you know, there's this idea in, you know, Western art history of this um the correct way or the proper way to for painting as this sort of top of this imagined hierarchy of of art and you both kind of are just sort of like eschewing that and you you play with certain sort of more classical or, or uh, traditional elements but then you sort of push that away and make it your own i mean both of you have in this way sort of interrogated the um that substrate or that that framework of, of how painting is supposed to be shown. I mean, even with your piece, Nani, the What Dreams May Come, which was in an exhibition here at the museum uh, last fall, uh, you know, it's, it's a work on canvas. It, it's in some ways functions as a mural, in some ways functions as, as a, a standalone painting that's portable. So it's, you know, like you said, it's this liminality, this in-between of it's, it's not either 
but it's both, you know, it, it, it takes this like in between space. Um, but at this point, I thought it would be a good idea to start um, uh, a few questions from the audience. So I'm going to invite Allison to, to pop back on and, and we'll get to hear some questions from, from those out there in, in TV land. Thank you. I just also want to say thank you both to our panelists. Um, it's been really great learning a little bit more about your work and seeing it. And um, I'm going to start my first question for Patrick. Uh, so um, just wanted, you know, one of our audience members wanted a little bit more clarification on uh, kind of your use on earth pigments. Uh, is that just kind of the clay or do you use any sort of like organic or plant material when you are uh, creating those paintings? Yeah, so um, the collection process um, starts from venturing out into different parts of the Navajo Nation. And um, there's, um, there's site specific places that I know have uh, certain color pigments or, um, you know, the geology of the landscape where whether it's sandstone, um, clay, rock, um, sand. Um, so and then also the different colors of dirt. Um, so those all all kind of um, just encapsulate the range of color that can be collected and then um, further processed and then also mixed with uh, different binders of uh, whether it's oil-based or polymer-based or um, different kinds of uh, experimentation with binder as, as it makes the actual paint substance. Thank you. And then this question is for Nani. And this is, you know, specifically about your constellation piece, but also in general, do you use any live models for your figures? They're always just so wonderfully and beautifully drawn. And, you know, if you do, were the two children in that mural based on anyone you know? Um, they weren't based on anyone I know. Or wait, um, no. They weren't. Um, sometimes I do. I, I ask people to model for me all the time, um, but I'm mostly doing it for form and, um, you know, like form and shape and light and all those kind of technical aspects of, of drawing a, a person. Um, and then from there, I, I it's mostly just a reference point, and and then I illustrate. Um, I think of myself as an illustrator. I like kind of that. I like drawing in that way um, and creating people and moments and feelings, I guess I could throw into that. Um, and the other thing that happens that I, I try to stay away from, although sometimes I'm very intentional about it, but um, when creating a, mur a mural, people always want to kind of place an importance or a significance on the people that are there. And I think in some ways it divides us. It makes us think that like, oh, that must be about that person and what their specific accomplishment is. So um, sometimes I really just want people to see themselves or to think about, you know, whoever, their sister, their child, their niece, their whoever, think about think of it as almost a space and a concept more than it is a person, um, an, an actual like identifiable person. But yeah, um, no, the, the, the faces changed completely made up um, for, the, for those pieces. That's amazing. I know um, I always have trouble without having a model present. So just the fact that you're able to um, kind of have those present themselves through the pieces is just fantastic. And then we just have one more question before we wrap up. Um, this is, you know, the pandemic has definitely affected all of our lives, especially um, those on the um, of the DNA people and you know just the question was you know with this kind of situation how do you find the energy and spirit to be so creative we can start with um maybe you Nani and then Patrick if you wanted to answer that yeah um I mean the pandemic was it's in and itself its own experience and I think for many many different people it it affected us all all differently at all different times um to be honest, I wasn't actually very creative. I felt like, you know, there was still some projects I had, 
I had to do, um, and I had to because um, aside from being an artist, this is my my career. This is my full time uh, full time bread and butter. Every all of that. So there there is parts of that I I have I have to maintain, um, but. It was very difficult. I, I was talking to another artist friend of mine and I was like, yeah, it's like it's like I can produce, but I'm a lot slower about it. And then some of it also felt like it wasn't something I even felt like it was even necessary. You know, I felt like there was maybe like a like a shadow on me. Um, so much of my work involves community interaction, people coming together, being in space. Um, and all of that, you know, wasn't wasn't able. So in a lot of ways, that Valle the Oro piece was interesting. And I worked on that during the pandemic, um, at least the first parts during lockdown. And for me, it was kind of kind of a saving grace in a weird way because it was something I had to get done. But it also I had time and space around it. And I I think that's also why I just kind of dove a little bit deeper into the technical sides of it and um, the experimentation side of painting and just let myself have some joy, you know, just really try to find the joy in my work. Yeah, so in um, 2019, I was um, starting the, my graduate program at the school and um, um, I didn't know in 2020 that we would be going through the lockdown so that experience for me was in and, in, in and of itself um, way different being um, away from home and then also with uh, my family, my children. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, um, you know, I, I went in and out. I had creative moments. I had creative, um, I guess, a couple of weeks at a, at a time. I would really be driven and then at certain times, um, I would feel feel that um, pressure of the pandemic and all all everything that went along with it, um, but it, it also was a chance for me to, uh, I guess, really um, enjoy it fully once again. Um, you know, I I like Nani said, um, it has this has been a full time um, profession for a number of years, and then through through being able to have that, I guess, kind of a pause in everything in that everyone experienced um, really allowed me to just um, basically really fall in love with art making again, uh, material process, um, just being able to be involved and uh, be really, um, I guess, um, um, being getting reacquainted with um, just really small, minute studio practice uh, details that sometimes are overlooked or in a um, that are kind of pushed aside as far as um, art making. So um, that's kind of how I I work through it. Um, you know, um, also being having to work from home um, was not really different for me just because I have an experience of uh, being a family process so, you know uh, just from lack of studio space uh, you know I've, I've pretty much raised my children within uh, they're pretty familiar with uh, what I do and then how how to respect uh, different areas of living so kind of invade our family space but at the same time uh, being able to uh, continue that studio process so Thank you. Yeah, I think we've all definitely found new ways to kind of work within our spaces, especially being uh, in our houses for so much of it. So yeah, it's definitely been, I think like a relearning experience. So, well, thank you both so much for your time. I will say that we have so many wonderful comments uh, in our comment sections, just, you know, expressing their love and appreciation for both of your work. So thank you again for sharing that with us. And it was great having this time with you and, you know, like, I said this will be recorded and put up on YouTube in about um, the next few days if not a week and if you have any questions anyone watching if you have any additional questions feel free to shoot me a quick email and I'd be happy to pass that along and thank you Erin uh, for moderating the discussion as well so uh, with that I'd like to wrap this up and say thank you to everyone.
and have a wonderful Thank afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, Patrick. Bye, Nani. Bye, Patrick. <laughs>